work. The place where we spend most of our waking hours. But unfortunately, for many employees, the picture that you see here is their view of work. Lost in a sea of cubicles with no connection to anyone. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if you could come to work knowing that there was somebody who was really looking forward to seeing you and who you were really looking forward to seeing? And what if it wasn't just one person, but it was a whole network of people who cared about each other and really enjoyed being together and were connected? And what if I was to go so far as to say that you should have love at work? Now, no, I do not mean this kind of love, all right? So not, not romantic love, but rather a love that psychologists have been studying for over 50 years, and interestingly, by the way, the most prevalent kind of love in our lives, which is companionate love. And companionate love are the feelings of affection, caring, compassion, and tenderness that we feel for one another. But imagine a situation where this companionate love isn't just occurring between two people at work, but rather, as leaders, you create a culture of companionate love. Now, this is a different way to think about culture than leaders normally think about culture. Leaders normally think about culture as something that I call cognitive culture, meaning the way that their employees should think about work and then behave. So that would be things like being results-oriented, having attention to detail, having integrity, all very important things. But what's been lost in this view of culture is that you can actually have something called emotional culture. And emotional culture is not about what employees should think and do when the boss is not around, but rather it's the emotions that employees should express or suppress when the boss is not around. And I want to show you an example of this through a culture of companionate love. So what I am showing you right here is a very classic model of culture. It's called the iceberg model of culture. And the idea behind this model is that most of where culture lives is actually under the iceberg, which is, by the way, why it can be so difficult to change. And if you go to the very bottom of the iceberg, you've got deep, basic, underlying assumptions that leaders in the organization and the people have about how we should behave at work or how we should feel at work. So, for example, in a case of a culture of companionate love, a way not to have companionate love is if you have a leader who fundamentally believes that emotions are completely inappropriate and have no room in the workplace because, of course, they get in the way of rationality, which actually we know is not the case. Um, an example of this I found very early on in my career. I was interviewing a bank vice president and I was very excited to hear about how emotional culture played out in, in his organization and emotions. And so I said to him, you know, how, how do emotions show themselves in your bank? And he looked at me and he drew himself up. He was already six foot two and he set up his desk in a way that everybody was shorter anyway. So he drew himself up, he looked down at me and said, professor? We have no emotions in our organization. And if we did, we'd have to get rid of them because there's no room for them in business, right? So if you have a leader who's feeling that way about emotions, you're not going to have a culture of companionate love. But if you have a leader who believes that it is not only appropriate, but actually necessary for people to really care about one another, to do a good job at work, you are much more likely to have a culture of companionate love. Now, the next level in a culture of companionate love would be the values that people hold in the organization. And there are two types of values. There are descriptive values, which is what actually exists in the organization. And then there are aspirational values, what you hope 
exists in the organization. And aspirational values very often are what you see on the website or in the cards that people carry. Although the goal, of course, is to have your aspirational values and your descriptive values be one and the same. In a culture of companionate love, the descriptive and aspirational values are about affection, caring, compassion, and tenderness among people for each other. People actually use those words, they talk about it in that way, and in fact, in a study of firefighters that my colleague Mandy O'Neill conducted, um, she, f she found that if you have um, a unit of firefighters who have this high culture of companionate love, then they say things like, you know, when one of us hurts, we all hurt. Right? It's, it's feelings of connection and affection for one another. And then at the very highest level, we have what, if I was to walk into any one of your organizations, I could see. And those are artifacts. So norms, physical space, things that indicate that people actually have love and care about each other in that environment. So for example, in a very classic organization, the very first really who pursued this aggressively, Southwest Airlines, right? You literally have the heart with love. Their, ticker, their symbol on Wall Street is L-U-V. Um, it could be a situation where people celebrate birthdays. It could be hugs. Um, it are th it's things that show people people on the surface that we care about one another. So that's what a culture of companionate love looks like, but what does it not look like? And the opposite of a culture of companionate love is not an abusive working environment. It's just not caring. And in one situation, a nurse who had 30 years of tenure with her organization went to her supervisor to say that her uh, mother-in-law had died. And he said, I have staff who deal with this. I, I, you know, please go to them, right? So it's not abusive, but it's absolutely not caring. And so if that's what a culture of companionate love is, um, the question is, why would you care? Why would you care about a culture of companion love? And so Professor Mandy O'Neill and I did a study in a long-term care setting where we looked at the culture of companionate love among employees. And what we found was that on units that employees had a greater culture of companionate love, that companionate love led to many, many different things in the workplace. For example, it led to better employee engagement. So people had more teamwork, um, they were more satisfied. It also led to less employee withdrawal. So there was more, um, people were not burnt out as much, which in this organization mattered a lot, and literally absenteeism was less. Um, it also led to better patient outcomes. So it rippled out past the employees, because remember, the culture of companionate love was among the staff, but it rippled out to patients, and patients reported better quality of life, better mood was observed by them, by their caretakers, and less unnecessary trips to the hospital. And then finally, it even rippled out one more step to families and the families of the patients saying they would be more likely to recommend it, uh, the place to uh, other people. And so the idea here is that a culture of companionate love, it's not just something you talk about and it sounds wonderful. What we found is that there's empirical evidence that it actually not only makes life better for employees, but it improves the workplace. And if you're wondering, how would I go about measuring a culture of companion love in my workplace? Like, how do I know how much I have? Well, in this study, we measured it in three ways. The first is we literally brought research assistants onto the unit and had them rate to what degree the staff were showing affection, compassion, caring, and tenderness to each other. We also looked for artifacts. So were birthdays being celebrated, for example? And then we also went the traditional means with surveys of the staff as well as the family. And what's really great for managers is that we found that there was a strong correlation between the three of these, meaning that you don't actually have to hire people to observe your employees to see how much companion and love, but you can do this through survey or through looking at artifacts and seeing is this something that exists in your organization. 
Now, you could say to me, okay, Sigal, this is great. I hear you, companionate love matters, but you know, that's really, that's in a healthcare setting. I mean, you know, isn't that kind of just part of what healthcare is? Um, and so we were interested in that as well. And so we did an additional part of the study, which is we surveyed over 3,200 employees across seven very different industries. Um, we looked at biopharma, we looked at engineering, we looked at finance, we looked at higher education, we looked at real estate, we looked at travel, and we even looked at public utilities. And across those very different industries, what we found is that the exact same thing about is there a culture of companionate love predicted greater job satisfaction, greater commitment to the organization, as well as greater personal accountability. And it's interesting because personal accountability is something that um, managers and leaders are caring a lot about these days. And, and in fact, has been a lot of what's been talked about here the past two days. And when we think emotionally about personal accountability, the lay theory is, you know, that negative emotions help accountability. Like, you've got to be accountable, right? Fear helps you, compliance helps you be accountable. But I have now um, looked at over 15,000 people who have completed this survey and looked at their personal accountability. And never has it been the negative emotional cultures that predict personal accountability. It is always the positive emotional cultures. It is the culture of companionate love and the culture of joy. And that is because people want to take then responsibility and accountability. And the other thing I want to remind you about a culture of companionate love and how you measure it and how you look at it is that this is not a measurement of how people are feeling at work, although they certainly can be feeling the companion to love, but it is a measurement of how much they are expressing it. And in fact, literally the questionnaire asks, to what degree do other employees in your work unit express the following emotions to really capture the culture? Now, given that we know that a culture of companionate love matters, how do you create it? How do you get to a culture of companionate love? Well, the first step, as in any culture, is actually you. Leadership sets the culture. And the reason for this is because your people look to you. They are monitoring you to see what matters in the environment. Now, what's interesting about emotional culture as compared to cognitive culture is that cognitive culture largely gets translated through words. Emotional culture gets largely translated through nonverbal. And so if you want to create a culture of companionate love in your organization, what the first thing that you need to do is you need to show that love yourself. You need to literally, in terms of your facial expression and your body language, show that love. And the reason for this has something to do with emotional contagion. And emotional contagion in groups is something I've spent much of my, my career studying. And the idea behind emotional contagion is that we literally catch emotions from one another like viruses. And what happens is you've got somebody who's happy, they then influence the next person who smiles, and the next person, and the next person, and the next person, until finally the, it has transferred through the entire group. And the way this happens is through a combination of behavioral mimicry, which is something we do from the time we are infants, coupled with actually then feeling the emotion. Now, unfortunately, emotional contagion does not only off operate positively. Emotional contagion can also operate negatively. So if you've got somebody screaming at you over the phone, then there's a good chance that you're going to catch that and that you're going to give that to the next person and the next person and the next person. And so this is something that can go in both ways. And actually, in one of my studies, I looked to see was negative more powerful than positive and found that they actually spread equally. Now, why is this particularly important to you as a leader? Is because what we've seen in the research literature is that leaders actually have the most power in terms of who spreads the emotion. And that's because people are literally looking at you. So they are more likely to, because um, emotional contagion is largely um, a subconscious process. And so if people are looking at you, 
they're more likely to catch your emotions. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't catch their emotions. You absolutely do. And so in the end, everybody is catching everybody's emotions. And so one very important takeaway I have for you here is be very conscious of how you come into work and how you actually act in terms of the emotions you're showing. But the second way that you can transfer um, companionate love is expressing the love even when you don't feel it. And an example of this, imagine the head of an accounting firm has their top accountant come in two days before tax day. And they say, look, I'm really sorry. You know, my significant, uh, there's been a death in the family of my significant other. I have to go. Now, your first emotion may not be at that very moment, affection, caring, and compassion. Your first emotion may be, ah, <laughs> you know, what do you mean you have to go? Can't they delay the funeral? It's really just your significant other. Maybe you don't need to go, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things that may be going through your mind. But you get yourself together and you know what your core values are around companion love and you say, it's okay, go, we will take care of it. And actually there's research showing that when we express emotions, we do start to actually feel them, both automatically as well as cognitively. Because the act of doing that then ultimately makes you feel better. They are looking at you saying, wow, this is the kind of company I work for. And it can also be transmitted through the organization in that way. Now, another way to transfer companion love in your company is similar to cognitive culture is to support it. It's to support it through things like value statements. So all of the companies I've just put here, and you'll see there are very many different industries, somewhere in their value statement, talk about caring, compassion. Some will even use the word love. Um, and that is a first start. You can also do it through your policies. So for example, a consulting firm that literally ties in how affectionate and caring you are into their performance appraisal and into their hiring, a media company which has instituted a policy that you can bring babies to work for the first six months where they're pretty, pretty quiet, um, but realize that that's important for their people. Um, and a CEO of a huge, hundreds of thousands, um, tech company who has a rule that he needs to be notified within 48 hours if there has been a death in anyone's family so that he can write a personal handwritten note or call. Those are structures and policies that can help you support a culture of companionate love. And while I know that everything I've talked about so far is what you can do as a leader, sort of top down, from a bottom up perspective, it's also creating and encouraging those micro moments of love where love really lives. It's that moment in the cubicle where you're actually connecting instead of walking away and checking in and bringing somebody, you know, coffee and pretzels because you know they've worked for a really long time. It's taking time and spending time together, sometimes off-site. It's recognizing people's birthdays or significant work or life events. And it's those moments in the elevator where you really look at someone and say, how are you doing? And you really want to hear the answer. And you're really listening to the answer. And so, in sum, what I would say to you that our research has shown is that love matters in business as well. And it's unusual to hear the word love in a business context. And from a personal perspective, Mandy and I had to make a decision when we first wrote this article about whether we were going to use the word companionate love. You know, we were advised, use words like caring, compassion, and by the way, not just for the business world, but for our own managerial academic world. You know, how could love really be appropriate in terms of the deep underlying assumptions? And what we decided was that while that would be uh, the easier way out, that it wasn't true to what we were studying. What we were studying was companionate love. Employees do not leave their humanity at the door when they walk into an organization. Employees do not leave their emotions at the door. And this emotion is one of the things that is the most powerful in our lives and in our work. 
And not only does it have a place, but companionate love helps employees and the organization's bottom line. Thank you very much.